You describe uh, Primo Levi and Anna Agmantova. Um, there's not much hope left, but still, um, they they think that bearing witness to what they saw is sort of the only way of, only option for consolation they've left. Mm. And um, isn't that a bit too optimistic about mm. <laughs> um, uh, the things that happened to Akhmatova? Or you know, she's you know, you describe her standing outside for one and a half year of the prison where her son is in, might be inside, you know, not talking to anybody. Um, uh, and that's just one of the, and Primo Levi is even, you know, mm. beyond description. So it's... I, yes, it, it, I have a chapter about three great witnesses to the great crimes of the 20th century. One of them is Anna Akhmatova. Many of you may know what a this sublimely gifted and courageous Russian poet who wrote a great book called, a great poem called Requiem, which was a attempt to memorialize all those who had stood like her outside prison gates um, trying to visit their loved ones who'd been arrested by Stalin. And uh, the second figure, obviously, is Primo Levi, who um, went to Auschwitz in 44 and barely survived it and came out in 45 and then spent the rest of his life writing th the great um, attempt to understand the meaning of Auschwitz. And then I have a third um, figure in, the, in this chapter who's not known at all and who deserves to be much better known, Miklos Radnoti, who's a Hungarian poet, um, one of the greatest poets of the Hungarian language. My wife, who's here, is Hungarian, and I owe the fact that I know anything about Radnoti to my wife. Um, and the thing about Radnoti, I won't go on about it, is that he is the only person I know who wrote sublime poetry on a death march uh, in late 1944. He wrote a number of short poems called Postcards, which were found on his body after the war. He's the only, the only artist I know who wrote literally in the pit of hell and managed to write these extraordinarily powerful, short, descriptive poems about what he was going through and the other... Um, Jewish labor service workers were going through. There's no, and, and so my question is not, well, the first question is, were they consoled by what they did? Um, in the case of Radnati, he wrote with a deep consciousness that if he didn't survive, the poems would survive. The only consolation available to him was that his poems might survive, although he was pretty sure he wouldn't. So to some extent, that is a consolation for him. Anna Akhmatova similarly wasn't altogether sure she would survive Stalin's purges, but she wanted to somehow make sure that there was a poet, poetic a record of that. Um, sometimes the consolation we seek is the future. The future will forgive us. The future will remember us. The future will acknowledge what we went through. And I think in the case of Radnati and, and uh, Akhmatova, this was definitely what they thought. Um, my, my second question, so we seek consolation for the in the future. We hope that the future will Will, um, will, will remember us. And sometimes we act on behalf of the future. If you allow a Dutch, a little Dutch interlude here, one of the most extraordinary figures to me is a Dutch professor of law at Leiden University who in 1940 stood up in, in, the, in the hall in Leiden to publicly defend um, a fellow professor, Jewish, who'd been stripped of his post. It was the first time anybody in occupied Europe had stood up to defend 
a fellow colleague and to protest the fact that he had been dismissed from his post. I mention him because when you look at his diaries of why he did what he did, the decisive factor was he had teenage children and he wanted, he wanted to be sure that when they grew up, they wouldn't be ashamed of him. So it's futurity and the sense that he had to count in the future that was so important. And some of that belief that the future will remember and redeem you is terribly important to how people behave. And Cleveringa, the great Professor Cleveringa, is an example of that. The other aspect of this, this, this chapter, however, which you mentioned, Yuri, is that um, is whether we can take consolation, our generation, your generation and mine, the people in this room, from the fact that there were these magnificent human beings who managed to bear witness to the abomination of the Holocaust. Um, and there is, I think, a desire, particularly with someone like Primo Levi, to read him and think, here was a man whose, whose courage, whose tenacity of witness, whose memory somehow <laughs> redeems the human race, given what else the Holocaust and Auschwitz tells us about the human race. And the interesting thing about Primo Levi, needless to say, is said, don't use me that way. Don't even try. Don't think about it. Nothing redeems that. It was what it was. I did what I did. He refused to allow himself to be the witness that somehow gives us all an alibi. You cannot be consoled by Primo Levi. He will not allow you to. And there's something tremendously powerful about that. Um, and so that's, that's what that chapter is struggling with. Whether we have the right to be consoled by the sublime example of other people. I think we can be inspired by it. <laughs> but... <laughs> It doesn't relieve us from the burden of understanding what was done there, you know, so. Yeah, actually, because I mean, you seem to draw, sometimes you seem to draw to the point or the conclusion that you can get solace from uh, the meaning of the text and the fact that it's palimpsest, that it's, that it's, you know, a, uh, handed down over the ages to us, that people have uh, written those texts, used, reused those texts. Um, sometimes you seem to be pointing to the sort of the possibility that in itself that is a consoling thing. Um, but again, but indeed, like you just pointed out, you know, um, Primo Levi, you know, actually writes down that no, it's not, you know, in yeah. his case. Yeah. But it's a, that's a particular case, of course. But um, uh, why would you say or why would you be able to draw sort of a, a conclusion that, you know, the condition of man is bearable <laughs> because we do pass down these texts through the ages, like the yeah. Psalms, you know, yes. who still have meaning and have been written yeah. by the psalmist. We don't even know who they are. But yeah, I think that the project began with the Psalms to come back to where we started. Um, and I think the recognition that occurred in the audience for many people, and certainly occurred to me, was just a sense that these psalmists, and we don't know who they were, it's kind of 1,800 years ago, 2,000 years ago, understand exactly what it's like to be lonely, desperate. Um, the words of the psalms, you know, I am as a sparrow alone on a rooftop. You know what I mean? Yeah, you, you see the little bird on the rooftop and you think, yep, that's what it's like to feel solitude, you know. Um, and then there are incredible, unforgettable descriptions of fear. You know, my, my body is turned to water inside me, that sense of, you know, um, so that part of the, what is consoling about the Psalms is that they know what you need consolation for, <laughs> right? Mm -hmm. You know, 
they have a, such a visceral sense, such a psychologically realistic and plausible account of what of the common experiences for which we need consolation. And that's half of it. It then creates a connection. Um, and then the other side of the Psalms, of course, are that it has some of the most beautiful language to express the hope that we yearn for. Um, and, uh, and some of the images of comfort, you know, the Lord is my shepherd, you know, the sense of having a shepherd look over, watch over us. Even if you're not a believer that there is a shepherd with a capital S, the image that you can be protected by someone who cares for you like a shepherd is very powerful and has been for 2,000 years a comforting thing. And the other point you're making, Yuri, which I think is also true, is that one of the ideas we have about living in the 21st century is we're alone, that all our traditions are kind of busted, and that we're in this experiment called modernity or postmodernity, and we're on our own. And I, I guess that feeling of existential solitude, I just think is wrong, because if you, if you do a little work, you realize we are the heirs of this incomparable human tradition. I mean, I looked only, as you say, at the European tradition, and I only scratched the surface of it. But it's not just the Psalms, it's everywhere in our culture, and in our language, and in our tradition. There are sources of, of comfort, and sources of solid, sources of meaning, that we need to cultivate. So part of the purpose in writing the book was say, there, <laughs> there, look at it. Go back to the, don't take my word for it, <laughs> you know, look up the books.